Lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Sneezy. <laughs> How's it going? Doing fine. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. I think the first intro was better than that one until you sneeze. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't help it, man. <laughs> like <laughs> You couldn't but, say, hold on a sec. <laughs> well, like I could feel it coming, but then I was like, ah, maybe that's not really a sneeze. Like, I can hold that, this back. Yeah. Well, sometimes <laughs> they just don't, don't come out, and that one did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it did. <laughs> so, sure did. Yeah. So yeah, there's um there's a, a pitch to contribute to the Liberty Mike podcast because the first thing we're gonna buy is to get Liberty Larry a uh, cough button. Yeah, well there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I do that a lot. So <laughs> yeah, see if we can we can allow him to mute himself <laughs> instead of just turning away and and using his cough pocket. Yeah, <clears throat> I do the best I can. So it's January sixth, man. Yep, yep. It's so. the, uh, how do you feel on this anniversary of the greatest threat to American democracy in the history of the country? This is, this is the 9-11 of our time, man. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's what I keep hearing. Yeah. I, and here I was, I thought 9-11 was the 9-11 of our time, but. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, Kamala Harris uh, compared it to Pearl Harbor, actually. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah, oh, wow. Pearl okay. Harbor. Well, okay. Um, so, yeah, real attack. I mean, when you when you look at the body count, I mean that that jives, right? <laughs> Let's see, one versus. Uh, I mean, I don't know what Pearl Harbor yeah, claimed, I'm not but sure. I think it was a few thousand. Yeah, yeah, it's, it was more than one, right? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and uh, the property damage was greater as well. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, I mean, they had the capital back up and running in a day. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> I think that uh, somebody got some dirt on a painting or something. Yeah. Uh, nah, I, I, it was worse than that, but um, but yeah. not significantly, honestly. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, to, to as far as over exaggerations are concerned, like. <laughs> yeah. I uh, just I don't get it, man. That's one of those words that drives me crazy. By the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. You should never tell me these things. I know, <laughs> I know, but I, I just want the <laughs> podcast listeners to realize that that at least one of us knows that over exaggeration is uh, superfluous because an exaggeration is an over like anyway. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I guess that, oh, I guess that launches us into talking about this first huh? Yeah, we might as well open up with that. I mean, we're uh, commemorating this, this event that, that happened on this day a year ago. This is the first anniversary. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a bunch of investigations going on all this time. Uh, I So I'm actually more excited to talk about this than I thought I was going to be. Yeah. Um, I, I've mostly tried to avoid this because this is one of those just like very politically divided topics. Yeah. And uh, because it's very politically divided, in it, for the most part, I don't see the point in talking about it because... People believe what they believe, and there's nothing that you're going to do about it. Yeah, there's so not a whole lot of people in the middle on this one. Yeah, it's it's just like so many other things, uh, you know, where it's just entirely based on perspective. To some people, the group is a bunch of freedom fighters, and to some other people, the group is a bunch of uh, terrorist, treasonous, whatever. They both seem the same to me. <laughs> both yeah, of those and, things are uh, kind of are the same thing to me. Like freedom fighters and terrorists are not that far apart. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it depends. It would be like uh, Star Wars. It would depend on whether you're telling it from the perspective of the, the, um, the empire or the rebels. Or the rebels. Exactly. Yeah. Like, um, the way I, I like, don't think it's quite like that either. No, but, but um, one thing that I, that I, it's been kind of my takeaway from this is that it's, if you have like real respect for the institutions mm -hmm. like this, then you think that they were terrorists and that, you know, this was a horrible thing. And if you're like me and I'm sure you too, that I don't really have that respect for those institutions. I think they're all a bunch of criminals and I don't think they should have any of those institutions anyway. Yeah. So I don't so much have a problem with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it goes back to that flag argument that I had with our representative. Yeah. Um, it's whether you value the symbol or the principle greater. Exactly. Um, and yeah. I, I mean, that's the, that's my perspective on it. Um, there's obviously another perspective, uh, to wit. Yeah. 
It also matters from the counterterrorism perspective, the world that I grew up in, which is if you view Trump as leading a terror movement, uh, we are the, these cases are undermining his ability to recruit, to, to raise money. And you're seeing that. You're seeing these organizations like the Proud Boys, very difficult for them to reform. So that would be the other side, I suppose. Um, <laughs> if you yeah. believe that Trump, that Trump, Trump. Um, if you believe that Trump is, has organized a terrorist movement, then like, yeah. none of the rest of it is going to make any difference to you. Right. <laughs> um, but no, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that the, like, if you value the capital as a symbol of democracy and that that or, or symbol of, I guess democracy. I don't know. Democracy is really the only other the way to look at it. Yeah. Like, I mean, that you, because I think that people do view that people that do view it that way view it as a symbol of democracy, mm -hmm. and of course they view democracy as a positive thing. Yeah, me and you once again may would have our <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and I I would say that the capital is the people's house, and yeah, you know, is the people that went in there. Yeah, it it, it has become a house for the elite. Yeah. for the rulers or whatever, but that's not what it was supposed to be. And yeah. uh, so I get maybe just the symbol is different for me, but, yeah. um, you know, the flag thing with, uh, with Bradley Byrne, that was, I guess, slightly different. And for those of you that haven't been listening long enough to have heard me talk about it before, uh, I got an argument with our federal representative about, he had introduced a, uh, Actually, he had introduced a constitutional amendment or yeah. was a co-signer or something for a constitutional amendment uh, banning um, burning of the U.S. flag. And um, <laughs> it, essentially what I told him is that uh, that he's gotten so focused on the symbol of the flag that he forgets what it, it's a symbol of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and uh, that, you know, I should be able to do as I please with my own property as long as I don't hurt somebody else doing it. Yeah. If I light up a flag and throw it in his face, then that's one thing. But if I'm just yeah. burning a flag, then there shouldn't be anything illegal about that. I'm making a statement yeah. with my own property. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that what that flag represents is my freedom to do exactly that. Yeah, and it, it kills me, and it, it, and always the retort back to that, at least from what I have seen, is always, well, you know, our our brave servicemen and women have died to protect that flag, and everybody mm -hmm. should have a little respect for it. I was like, they didn't die for that flag. Yeah. Like even Hopefully. if you even if you believe that, which mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we can go down the whole rabbit hole. We don't need to there, mm -hmm. but even if you do believe that, you have to know that. They weren't dying for the flag. They were dying for what it represents. Yeah. They which is the freedom. For the, for the freedom for the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So. Um, I, I certainly would like to think that, that most people who have fought for this country fought for my ability to burn that flag if I choose. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they may even, not like it. Even, now, I, I think that you suffer the consequences of what you do, too. So yeah. if I go and I burn that flag in front of a group of Marines and I get the <laughs> stuff kicked out of me. Yeah. You had that coming. That too. <laughs> you had that coming. Yeah. You know. I mean, I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> Risks, decisions, consequences, and it's all part of it. Exactly. Yeah. But I don't think one of those consequences should be the police coming to arrest you. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Sometimes vigilante justice is the best justice. Yeah, and I can't remember exactly <laughs> what the the penalty for burning the flag was, but it was like they literally wanted to make a constitutional amendment to outlaw flag burning. I'm sure it was a fine or something, mm, but even still, but that's what if still, I don't pay the fine? Well, yeah, well, <laughs> well, and then you go down that rabbit yeah. hole of you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. At some point, men with guns will. <laughs> well. I, I do think that there's some stuff that a year later um, that's worth reporting about this. And it goes along with some things that we have talked about in the past. Um, but let's start with the little NPR um, intro or summary clip and go ahead and throw that in here right now. And then we'll get into a discussion about what some of the things that are really going on in the background. All right. The investigation into the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol is approaching the one-year anniversary. As NPR's Ryan Lucas reports, officials say the probe is one of the largest in U.S. history. More than 700 people have been charged in the Capitol riot investigation so far, and more are being indicted on a weekly basis as FBI agents chase down leads and prosecutors put cases together. Of the defendants who have been charged, around 150 have pleaded guilty. Of those, just under half have been sentenced. 
most of them for misdemeanor offenses such as unlawfully parading or picketing in a Capitol building. So I got a kick out of that. So um, they they said that the FBI agents are like investigating this and whatnot. I said I wa- one of the biggest investigations in history. I wonder if those any of those agents were there. Well, <laughs> just that's, just uh, throwing that out there. Like, um, not, I, I can say with relative certainty that some of them were. Absolutely. I mean, if it's one of their biggest investigations in history, I mean, there, I don't think there's much doubt in my mind that there was a bunch of FBI agents on the ground. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the question becomes like my first thought in all that um, is, you know, biggest investigation in history for something that really appears to me to be a fairly minor incident, yeah. especially, and I don't want to go down this path particularly, but especially in light of what had been going on that entire summer before. Well, and, and that's, that's a good point. That's at least worth mentioning mm-hmm. that if they could pour this much resources into what happened at the Capitol that day, mm-hmm. but they didn't pour any of those resources into whole cities, basically burning down right before that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, like I say, it's it's one of those parallels. I've seen it, so I've been on social media a little bit today, and I keep seeing that parallel being drawn mm-hmm. on social media. So it's it's it, it's worth mentioning that, you know, that, I mean, that's something yeah. that could, those resources could have been pulled towards that and haven't been. If those big city uh, riots related to the Black Lives Matter movement are mostly peaceful, then so was the Capitol riot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But the difference, as we pointed out before, is that in those, uh, in a majority of the cases in the the riots over the previous summer, um, they were directed at private businesses, uh, private people. The difference is that this was directed at the seat of government. Yeah. um, And that can't be permitted. Uh, Oh, absolutely. By those people that control that government. Yeah. Yeah. and when I say that can't be permitted, I mean, I don't mean that I feel that way. I mean, yeah. that's the, the... But the powers that be feel yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. Can't let that go. Yeah. Can't let people feel like they actually have a voice. Whereas, you know, my point would be that, um, you know, for the most part, it, w- it was a peaceful assembly. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, eventually they broke in through the... the um, police barricades and entered the Capitol building and so forth. But even there, there wasn't that yeah. much violence. I mean, you um, see and the they, videos they, of people like staying behind the barricades. Like I mean, you could seriously make an argument that some of those people just found their self themselves there, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, Oh wow, we're in the Capitol building. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And there's more to that too, because the, before Trump's speech was even over some of these, um, provocateurs that that got things kicked off in terms of the illegal activity pushing through the barricades and so forth actually pulled barricades down and removed them um from the pathway from the trump speech to the capitol yeah um and removed them in a way as if they hadn't been there yeah Um, (laughs) and and parts of that um were places that were generally open to the public but had been closed down that day yeah. And so, you know, some of the suggestion is that they were essentially baited into what became an illegal act that they had no way of knowing was an illegal act. I, I think in a lot of cases, the, the strong argument could be made, in, especially in defense of some of those people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and the, you know, they keep, they still to this day talk about the deadly riots on January 6th, the deadly capital riots. But it, to my knowledge, the only person who died in those riots was yeah. Ashley Babbitt that was shot by DCPD. Yeah. yeah. Or Capitol Police. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you have uh, Brian Sicknick, who they still blame his death. I mean, Biden, anyway, still blames yeah. his death on the rioters. But there's been no criminal prosecution on that. Yeah. Um, and uh, the they have dropped uh, any case related to that. I mean, I think it's been fairly definitively proven that he, his death was unrelated. Yeah. Well, (laughs) it is an unfortunate event, but not related to the riot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and then, you know, the stories about, uh, people beating, um, police officers with, uh, uh, fire, fire extinguishers and stuff like that turned out not to be true. Um, I don't know. 
this has been blown way out of proportion, but there's, there's so much more to it than that. And I talk about, you know, the, the provocateurs that kick things off before Trump's speech had even ended. Um, and, uh, and actually, it's Revolver um, dot news that's done most of the the in depth reporting, and I, I rely on them mostly for this because they're the only ones that seem to have really dug into this. Yeah. Um, now you do have some corroborating reports from the New York Times and some other places yeah. uh, that are more recognizable, but um, you know, there's just some interesting coincidences, and uh, you think about it in light of that there's been seven hundred uh, people prosecuted or charges brought against 700 people is what they said in that, um, that news clip. Yeah. And, um, that the majority of them were for misdemeanor offenses yeah. of being someplace that you weren't supposed to be essentially. Yeah. And, uh, while they keep making the case, um, publicly, uh, and in the news that it, it was an insurrection. Now there's also, by the way, been no gun charges at all brought in this. Um, and I, the only weapons charges have been improvised weapons like, um, uh, flagpoles and things like that, that people Stuff had, they found. You yeah. Know. Um, so I don't know who, <laughs> who thinks that anybody would plan an insurrection to overthrow the government of the United States of America without bringing any guns. Yeah. Right. <laughs> seems like, it seems like a fool's errand. <laughs> does, doesn't it? Um, but the some of the information that's come out in these re- revolver investigations um, and elsewhere. Uh, in fact, we'll start with the New York Times. The the New York Times reported that a Proud Boys member who was also an FBI informant was in contact with his FBI handler uh, for days before and during the one six event, um, which just on its face suggests that the FBI was aware of the increased security risk that, that yeah. there may be something planned or some kind of violence happening. If we're to believe all these conspiracies that the proud boys, the oath keepers, the three percenters, those are the ones that they blame primarily yeah. um, planned an insurrection. Yeah. Right. So if the proud boys were planning an insurrection and one of these guys was an FBI informant and was contacting, talking regularly, texting, I think actually, um, but communicating regularly with his handler, then they should have known something was coming. Yeah. Um, and so then you're left with the question of, well, if they knew something was coming, did they just not take it seriously or did they intentionally let it happen? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I I guess, so one of the others is, um, the big person that keeps coming up is this guy, Ray Epps. Right. So, um, Ray Epps, uh, he, he, there's been a bunch of videos of him. Like he is all over the place on January 5th and January 6th. He's this kind of older gentleman, not old, but older, um, gentleman. Uh, he's wearing like, uh, fatigues and a MAGA hat. And he's like constantly, he, uh, what you see when you get like these put together timelines of his movements from other people's recordings yeah. is you see him moving from group to group and wherever, wherever there seems to be a group gathered around somebody who's making some kind of pronouncements about, you know, why we're here, you know, we freedom, our freedoms are being taken away, whatever, you know, whatever they happen to be talking about, he inserts himself and says, you know, something that's kind of vague about, you know, this is about the constitution and, uh, you know, we need to go to the Capitol. We need to go in the Capitol. Like this is his thing that he keeps <laughs> He's hammering, beating this hammering, drum, hammering yeah. over. We got to stay focused on what's important. We need to get into the Capitol. Yeah. And this is starting on the night of January 5th and goes through January 6th. And there's like this really clear video of him, um, at the entrance essentially to the Trump rally, yeah. just talking to everybody that goes by about how, when this is over, we're going to the Capitol. Tell everybody <laughs> we're marching to the Capitol. We're going to go into the Capitol today. You know? Yeah. Um, um, and so initially he was, uh, placed on the FBI's most wanted for the January 6th event. Yeah. Um, and, uh, they, you know, they put out, they, they put out so many of these things at the very beginning, like all these little pictures of people at the, at the January 6th event mm-hmm. saying, if you have any information about who this is, please, con- please contact the FBI, so on, so on. Yeah. So he was one of those people and they got a bunch of information about him from yeah. the, uh, I guess the social media mob. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, 
so a little background on him. Um, he's maybe a former oath keeper. He may still be an oath keeper. Yeah. This becomes important. Like, remember this oath keeper, cause this comes okay. up a lot, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, he's, uh, there's also a video of him. Um, okay. Well, actually let me, I'll come back to that. Uh, anyway, he's to date been, has, he's been clearly identified. We know who he is. Yeah. Um, he has not been indicted. Yeah. He has not been arrested and he's been quietly removed from the most wanted list hmm. from the FBI. And like when I say removed, not, you know, they leave the people up that they arrest and they just mark them as arrested. Yeah. Like his picture has been taken down. So it's not even there. It's not anymore. there anymore. So the space that they just squeeze the pictures together together from the people <laughs> that were on either side of him in the list. Wow. And really? he's has been taken down. That happened on July first, apparently. Huh. Um and so you can still go to the archive.org and find the image from June thirtieth where he's listed as number sixteen. Yeah. On the FBI's most wanted. And then on July first, it goes number fifteen, number seventeen. Wow. <laughs> interesting yeah and so um you have to wonder like who was this guy really working for <laughs> yeah and because one of the big things is that uh he is on video um whispering into the ear of uh this guy ryan samsel who they've really kind of thrown the book at in a lot of ways yeah. um who they say is the first person to break the law essentially yeah. um so like literally moments before Ryan Samsel pushes down the first barricade, the, yeah. the first police barricade, the first breakthrough of a barricade is done by Ryan Samsel. And literally moments before this guy grabs him, pulls him back a little bit and whispers something in his ear. Yeah. Hmm. And it's yeah. on video. It's yeah. like <laughs> clear as can be. And yeah. then this guy is also ends up on the other side of the Capitol yeah. When that barricade's broken down. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's clearly like a significant part of this. He's the one yeah. inciting people to go to the Capitol for at least a day. Yeah. Um, you know, before. Yeah. Um, and he is the last person to speak to uh the person, the first person to break through a barricade. Yeah. Um, and seems to be delivering him instructions. And there's a there's another video where he's delivering some other guy instructions that no. Um, you know, it, I don't know. So he seems to be a really important part of this and yeah. the FBI at least thought so at the very beginning. Yeah. 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 And then he's just like not a part All of it of a anymore. Sudden, yeah, exactly. No, something ain't right. And if you say, well, you know, the FBI wouldn't put somebody that was working for them on their most wanted list. Well, they, they might, <laughs> like well, if they don't realize what they're doing. Well, that's part of it. I mean, the, and, and so, but the best example I think to give to people that they would recognize as Whitey Bulger. Okay. Um, you remember Whitey Bulger was a Boston mob guy yeah. um, who was on the FBI. In fact, he was like number two on the FBI's most wanted list right behind Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Um, but as it turned out, he'd been working as a, as a confidential informant to the FBI for years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that people, people know that because of the Johnny Depp movie yeah. um, about his life. Yeah. Um, but anyway, while he was he was on the most wanted um while being a, a confidential informant of the FBI but most of the the special agents most of the field agents didn't know yeah um it because, was high level information because it's well and this would this would jive to be the same thing like this would be high level information that mm -hmm. not everybody on the ground would know right. and it seems like it would be really easy for something like that to happen yeah um and in Whitey Bulger's case he was being protected by higher ups at the FBI yeah. While he was still out there, like running his criminal enterprise, but being a confidential informant, you can't exactly take him off of that because then you're going to like blow the whole cover if right. you do. Like, I mean, it, it's going to become pretty obvious pretty quick to a lot of people. All of a sudden, we don't want this guy anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so uh, then, as a, another because I, I just really want to talk about these two people because okay. they're they're people who we know who they are. Yeah. Um, not Whitey Bulger. He's just an example. I'll come back to some more of those <laughs> yeah. uh, in a minute too. But uh, the other guy at the January 6th things is uh, Stuart Rhodes. 
Yeah. Um, Stuart Rhodes is the founder of the Oath Keepers. Again, like the like most indicted um, group at the January 6th is the Oath Keepers. Yeah. Um, they have been identified with a conspiracy to overthrow the government, et cetera, et cetera. This guy is the founder of the Oath Keepers. Um, he was referenced repeatedly in the conspiracy indictments against other members of the Oath Keepers. Uh, he was involved in January 6th and played an active role in communications and any planning um, that may have gone into it beforehand, et cetera. Like he was a part of all this. Like they have all these transcripts of uh, phone conversations. He's on like half of them. Yeah. You know, like, and all this stuff. And his his interaction with these people is being used in the indictments against them. Yeah. As part of the Oath Keepers as a conspiracy uh, at the January 6th event. Yeah. But this guy. I was fixed to say, let me guess. Has it been indicted? This guy remains free. Yeah. Remains unindicted. Yeah. And he's apparently of very little interest to the FBI. Like, they haven't done search warrants or anything. I mean, <laughs> they, they took a cell phone from him, um, and they gave it back. It's crazy to me that that a, a member, that so clearly he's been working for the FBI, and probably for a long mm -hmm. time. Like, mm -hmm. so that the FBI has people at high levels in these type of organizations, just like... Yeah. Kind of there, you know? Yeah. Um, well, uh, Merrick Garland was a part of the um, the attempts to start trying to lure out people that were opposed to the government. The, these internal domestic terrorists, I don't think they called them back, that back then, but yeah. um, domestic terrorists, the guy who's the current attorney general, Merrick yeah. Garland, yeah, yeah. Um, and who was almost a Supreme Court member. Almost, Thank God we yeah. dodged that one. All right. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and the you know they developed this way of of uh, trying to draw these people out, and in a lot of ways, just like creating a reason for their own existence, as so many government agencies end up doing. Yeah. Um, but like in order to, I mean, I don't know. I, the best way to say it, I guess, is that in order to fight against these dangerous organizations, they started to form them. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't really. If they don't exist, you gotta. Maybe you gotta create them. Yeah. <laughs> to draw these other people out, or however they justify it, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and so y there's no reason. I, I mean, I guess there's reason, but you can't discount the possibility that the Oath Keepers was created by an FBI asset yeah. or an intelligence asset to begin with could be yeah. military intelligence too. I mean, most of these guys are, are former military in one way or another. Yeah. Um, but that the Oath Keepers was formed, um, by a, an intelligence asset of the U S government, mm. um, to draw in people that were opposed to things that the U S government was doing to bring them out so yeah. that they can start reporting on them so that they yep. know who all these people Keep tabs are. on them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So. Um, and draw them into these kinds of situations where they have an excuse to arrest them. Exactly. And you don't, I mean, it sounds crazy, but you don't even have to go back very far. I mean, you can start with, um, there's so many more examples, but yeah. there's two really good ones that I think people will recognize. Yeah. Um, one of them is, uh, Ahmad Salim. Um, who was an FBI informant uh, involved in the 1993 World Trade Center attack where they put the truck bomb in and the plan was to make one tower collapse against the other tower. Yeah. All right. Um, so I, I don't want to go into the details. People should just go look it up. But um, the this guy who was an FBI informant uh, was providing all this material and information not just to the FBI, but to the terrorist organization as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was so deeply involved in the plot that it probably could not have happened, happened without him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If he hadn't been there. Yeah. So um, there's one example. And then a more recent example is the, uh, the Michigan um, Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping thing that happened uh, in October of 2020, coincidentally, this is yeah. our October surprise. Yeah. Um, and do you remember this when I, I the Michigan militia was taken down? A bunch of people were arrested for planning to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer at her vacation I home. Vaguely and, remember and that. hold her, um, uh, Some... give her a trial for treason or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the, yeah. the details of the plan were, but um, anyway, so. That happened, and there were 14 people indicted initially on this. Yeah. And it 
turns out that of those 14 people, five of them yeah. were either FBI informants or undercover agents. Yeah. <laughs> and then in the broader conspiracy uh, of the 26 people involved in the plot, almost half, 12 of them yeah. were either FBI informants or undercover agents. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy, man. Like, and, and, but it goes to that whole, like creating this narrative of, well, you can't trust your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's, that's where kind of, I take some of this information and you know, that's, yeah, it's like the NKVD just getting involved in everybody's lives and being a part of every plot for everything. Yeah. Um, just so that they can get you down this road and then turn you over. Yep, exactly. And, um, and just as a as a side note, uh, right after the all these arrests for the Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping thing, um, the head of the Detroit field office of the FBI, a guy named uh, Stephen uh, D'Antuono or D'Antuono, I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, he was promoted to the head of the D.C. office. Ooh. Yeah, and guess what he's doing right now? What's that? He is the lead on the January 6th investigations. Of course he is. <laughs> Coincidence? Yeah. I think not. <laughs> so there's a lot of reason to doubt a lot of this stuff that's going on. Um, yeah. And well, it's, and, and it's, for those on the left that think, oh, well, you know, now the 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 right wing has just got this conspiracy about how the government is entrapping them or whatever. Yeah. Just like, think back, think back to the sixties and what was going on during the Vietnam war yeah. where the FBI was doing the exact same thing to, uh, to groups, the anti-government groups on the left. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. and including, uh, you know, uh, blackmailing, uh, Martin Luther King jr. And like all of the stuff that, you know, happened. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I mean, the, your government is not above doing this. Yeah. Like for anybody to believe that our government is above doing anything like this just ignores history completely. Yeah. Um, and and it, it really is funny to talk to people because you'll bring up stuff like you just did. Um, and they'll be like, yeah, but that was a long time ago. And <laughs> yeah, like, they've just gotten better at it. Yeah, like you don't, you think that they quit. There were no consequences when they did it then. Mm -hmm. What makes you think they're not doing it now? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's, that's as simple as argument as you need. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there's no reason to believe that they, they discontinued these practices. Right. Like, I mean, there's no reason to believe it. Yeah. The difference is that in the, in the sixties and seventies, it was the left wing, um, radicals that were the most anti-government. Well, it, and but it now goes, it's the right-wing radicals it, that are the most anti-government. I was going to say the the common theme there is is the government has to protect the government. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's what this is, and and that's what's going on right now. Um, and I do think that the anti-government side is starting to pick up some real steam. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope. Um, I, I wish we could all kind of unite under this and maybe really get somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's like the, um, okay, we may as well uh, transition into some of this COVID stuff now um, mm. because it, it fits right in, in terms of your government lying to you. Yeah. Um, and so what was it that I heard? I heard Fauci say something the other day. I think it was Fauci. Might have been, um, oh, what's her name from the CDC? Uh, whose name escapes me right now. Um, anyway, um, and the, you know, something along the lines of, uh, you know, we, we know that you're more protected from the Omicron variant if you get boosted, et cetera. You know, one of these kind of oh, things. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I was thinking, like, it's gotten to the point with this kind of stuff where whenever I hear them say anything, I hear, um, you know, the the... Uh, the we know that the Iraqis have weapons of mass destruction. Um, these are mobile chemical weapons laboratories. Yes. Um, yes. That uh, we are not collecting data on millions of Americans. Yeah. Uh, I did not have sexual relations with that girl. <laughs> you know, like yeah. how many times do you have to be lied to before you start stop believing the lie? Yeah. yeah. Where? Where? Right. How do you maintain trust through all of this? Well. The good news is I think that more and more people are seeing through it. Yeah. Well, um, and I, I don't know if that's the cause or the effect here, because what I kind of wanted to point out is how the narrative is breaking down and the the leaders of the narrative are reversing course on a lot of things. Yeah. So now you have uh, Leanna Wynn, the, Dr. Leanna Wynn, who's been the CNN um, 
correspondent on this thing the whole time that's now openly saying that cloth masks don't work. Yeah. Yeah. The the cloth masks are little more than a face decoration, I think is what she said. Yeah. Um and I had the clip somewhere and I cannot find it. But so we won't play it. But it it's, happened. It's it's out there. Like I mean I <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then she doubled down on it um because when she initially said it, she said, uh in the case of the Omicron variant, these cloth masks um don't have any value. Yeah. And then when she was pressed about it, she was like, well, they've never had any value, that they didn't do anything against any of the versions of COVID that we've dealt with, which is, of course, something that I that may have been the reason that we had a YouTube video taken down is for saying exactly that. Yeah. Oh, Um, yeah. And uh, which is I I don't want this to turn into an I told you so. (laughs) But (laughs) well, it's it's a good argument, though, for like people you social media and we need to have be able to have conversations about stuff like this Mm -hmm. and the environment we live in and so when when twitter and facebook and all these things first came out you could do that like you could say whatever you wanted to them on Mm -hmm. them and it wouldn't matter like nothing was getting taken down there was not even a thought like you could say some dirty nasty stuff and Mm -hmm. it wasn't getting taken down yeah but like now the pendulum swung the other direction to where you can't even have like a conversation over mm-hmm. some of these topics yeah. without uh, like a, a civil conversation about the stuff and it be not be taken down. Yeah. Well, I mean, now that they're coming out and they're saying that uh, the vaccine won't prevent you from getting the virus. Now they claim that they never said that it would prevent you from getting the virus, but they did. It's all, it's, it's out it's there. Out, oh yeah. yeah. It's all, it's recorded Biden all over the place. said that all over the place. God, so he did said Fauci. it a lot. And <laughs> so did Fauci. Oh yeah. Um, and that you can't transmit the virus. That Fauci said something along the lines of, if you get a vaccination, then the, you know, COVID ends with you. Yeah. That's the end of the line or something for yeah. the COVID. Um, which turns out not to be true at all. And now no. they're telling us it's not true. Oh, yeah. well, actually, it turns out that you can, you know, still get the virus. Oh, and you can still transmit the virus. Oh, and uh, a booster will help, uh, but we don't actually know for how long, yeah. um, which is also could be translated into, we don't really know that the booster would help. We think so. Yeah, it, it could hurt, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, that's yeah. <laughs> that's really, the at this point, that's what I'm taking their argument as. If my product's not working, it's because you haven't had enough of it yet. <laughs> exactly. Um, yep. you know, that works with whiskey, but not maybe with the COVID vaccine. Um, and then, uh, so then uh, we've got this one from Fauci, which is just a real gem as far as I'm concerned. And we'll go ahead and play that clip. All right. And I want to ask uh, specifically about hospitalization. One of the recent concerns, I'm sure you're getting asked a lot about this. How do you explain the sudden increase in hospitalizations among children? I mean, if Omicron is less severe and 15 to 20 percent less likely yeah. to send someone to the hospital, how, why are we seeing this sudden increase in children at hospital with COVID? Well, that's a good question. And there are two things that contribute to that. First of all, quantitatively, you're having so many more people, including children, who are getting infected. And even though hospitalization among children is much, much lower on a percentage basis than hospitalizations for adults, particularly elderly individuals. However, when you have such a large volume of infections among children, even with a low level of rate of infection, you're going to still see a lot more children who get hospitalized. Okay, and here's the real important one, his second point. Yeah. The other important thing is that if you look at the children who are hospitalized, many of them are hospitalized with COVID as opposed to because of COVID. And what we mean by that. If a child goes in the hospital, they automatically get tested for COVID and they get counted as a COVID hospitalized individual when, in fact, they may go in for a broken leg or appendicitis or something like that. So it's overcounting the number of children who are, quote, hospitalized with COVID as opposed to because of COVID. So wouldn't that apply to adults also? Absolutely, it would. And Um, so this is something we've been saying the whole time. Like this is, this is how they've been inflating these numbers. mm -hmm. Like he just, this is one of the ways. This is one of the ways like this, but this is a big one. Like Mm -hmm. this is, this is definitely one of the ways that they, they have been inflating these numbers and making them look worse than they are. 
Yeah. Like, I mean, that's bottom line. Like, yeah, absolutely. It, it's all right there out in the open. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, there ain't no, I mean, it came from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Um, but at the same, well, do we trust him now? <laughs> Well, I mean, do you? I mean, this. I mean, I would say this is an instance. I mean, he's he's omitting yeah. the fact that this that they've been doing this with everybody. Mm-hmm. But well, I mean, so that's as this narrative starts to shift. And as by the way, um, this is just another example, as far as I'm concerned. Like, I will put the record of the the statements of the Liberty Mike against Fauci. <laughs> on COVID. Oh, yeah. Any day of the week. Oh, yeah. Without question. We've been saying the same thing the whole time. Now he's coming around to saying what we've been saying the whole time. Exactly. Um, That's exactly and, what this is. <laughs> so, but the the question to me becomes, all right, so why now? Is it that the narrative, is it that the facts are so, such an opposition to the narrative that they don't feel that they can maintain the narrative that they've had this whole time anymore. And so they're going ahead and shifting because you can't get people to continue, you know, the don't believe your lying eyes kind of yeah. um, well, thing. We, we are at a tipping point, I think, because the, I think that they know that this Omicron variant is pretty well the end. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I'm sure they're going to push other variants. Don't, don't think that they're not going to, but the uh, this this variant is worse than the variants that are going to come later, and there's, there's not much to this variant. Mm-hmm. Like it's we're, we're at the end here, so I think that they know that, and they've got to start pumping the brakes on some of this stuff. Yeah. To to if they're if they're going to have it maintain any type of legitimacy, mm-hmm. um, at least in their mind. I mean, and the reality is, is I think they've lost it anyway. Yeah. But um, they don't realize that. Um, do you think it's to maintain their legitimacy to just, uh, you know, that you can't compete against what's obvious to people at some point, or do you think it's do you think it's political? That's the other question. Well, is you I, know, I do we, think we it's are political. starting to come into uh, the campaign season for the twenty twenty two midterms. Yeah. Um. So is the shift because uh, Democrats don't want to fight uphill against? Um, I mean, they can't fight about against, mandates and stuff like that. Uh, probably uh, because they know that's a losing uh, battle. Like, I mean, that's mm-hmm. uh, that one's I mean, they can in, they can institute those and enforce them, but they can't win on them at the ballot box. Yeah. Um, and and they have to know that. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's not <laughs> that's not like a, a, that's pretty obvious to anybody paying attention, mm-hmm. at least so, in most places. Yeah, I, I, I would say in the majority. But mm-hmm. I mean, maybe not. I mean, I don't know. I don't live in New York, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, and even New York, it would be New York City Particular, versus yeah. the rest of the when state. When I say New York, that's <laughs> yeah. actually what I mean. But yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, you can't, that, that's that's not a winner. Like, they've mm-hmm. got to pump the brakes on this somehow. And mm-hmm. I think that that, that that actually is a big part of what, what you're seeing right now. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, good. I mean... It's about time for this to end. Uh, I think it was, again, the New York Times um, that uh, sent out a tweet, something along the lines of that um, the data suggests that a 75-year-old catching COVID um, mortality is only like 1 in 200, uh, which is roughly the same as a flu for somebody, you know, for a 75-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, And so... Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but at the same time, there are places that have started talking about the idea of mandating flu vaccines. Yeah. Like, well, because, uh, because we've once opened you've a put, door. yeah, I yeah. was fixed to say, once you've put something like that out there, mm-hmm. it's really hard to put it back in the box. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, you, yeah, we man, well, we did it with COVID and the flu kills so many people as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, it becomes a, a problem of not letting people make their own choices, mm-hmm. you know? So, which once again, just throwing it out there, ain't a winner at the ballot box. Yeah. I mean, Democrat or Republican. I mean, a Democrat would air a little more okay with that than a Republican. Mm-hmm. But even the Democrat, a lot of Democrats are like, ah. Well, it depends on the topic. This particular topic, you're absolutely yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'd agree with that. Yeah. 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 Um, now, I, I was thinking earlier, like, is it a democracy if you. All right. 
Do you see it as authoritarian or democratic if every four years you elect a new authoritarian? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> like, does it change the style of government? Do you want an authoritarian government? Well, we don't have an authoritarian government. We we vote. Well, if you vote for somebody who is going to rule over you, even if you replace that person every four years, yeah, it's still authoritarian, is it not? Well, the other thing I would point out is like what a quarter of people in this country actually vote anyway. Yeah. Like it's not actually like it's a full fledged, like, I mean, it's not true democracy. Like, I mean, yeah. at least. Well, and I don't even, uh, you know, we've certainly hammered democracy plenty on this podcast, but the, you know, the big question is about what about the people that didn't vote for what you voted for? Yeah. Like what about the people who lost? Yeah. You just got to suck it up because you're in the minority. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the, I know we've talked about it mm -hmm. before, but that's the reason our politics and people talk about this a lot. Like, mm -hmm. especially when you talk to like normies, people who don't keep up with this stuff the way we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way I'm sure a lot of our listeners do, but when you normies talk, kind of a pejorative, <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, you get what I'm saying though. Um, mm -hmm. the, they're always like, well, I just don't have anything to do with politics because it's also divisive and it's also, but the reason it's that way is because one half gets to rule over the other half. Yeah. Like that's, that's what creates that divisiveness. Like yeah. you start rolling back government and I mean really rolling it back. Mm -hmm. You start alleviating a lot of these problems. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, um. Oh, uh, I did have one more thing before we wrap up. Do you do you have more to add to that before? Not we... not that particular thought, but I did want to say one more thing about just the the tech censorship and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's that never in history have the guys that have been been censoring and burning books, things of that nature, ever really been the good guys. Yeah, it's all they're they're always the bad guys. So just mm -hmm. keep that in mind as these tech companies and our government pushes for more and more censorship that mm -hmm. like that's that's yet to ever be lead down a good road. Yeah. Well, uh, even broader than that, um in history the people that want to force or impose their ideas in others. Yeah. Have Once never again, really been the good guys. Never the good guys. Like just something to keep in mind out there. Yeah. Um Okay, well, so this is a, kind of a tech thing, sort of. Okay. I can't transition in that way exactly. But uh, so my mom said after the last podcast that um, that we should have given numbers on the Elon when we started talking oh, about Elon. The Musk. Elon Musk thing, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, well, we, I like his name was nowhere in my notes. Like we had <laughs> and no really planned on talking about that. talking about it. It just came up, which happens a lot. By the way, oh, like, yeah, this yeah. is this is definitely a stream of consciousness. <laughs> yeah, at but, least on this side of the mic. <laughs> yeah, the, well, it, on the last podcast, I have three lines of notes. Yeah, and one of them I crossed through because I started to write out the um, Nuremberg. Uh, code thing and then oh, i was yeah. like well i'll just read it off my phone why am i writing it down so i really only had two notes and one of them is a name once again <laughs> just to throw back to that so i threw a meme up on the liberty mike page i'm terrible at uh, names after you'll see it when we post the podcast um after we did this podcast referring to exactly what we had talked about with the mm -hmm. nuremberg thing mm -hmm. and uh guess what it got <laughs> oh did it get censored or did it, it just it only, get uh, it fact checked it, it only got well it got both actually like okay. so it didn't get taken down but it got a bl very blatant, hard to to look past censorship with okay. a fact check on on that, letting us know that that there was there was some some information missing from this post and yeah. Was it just about um, that it uh, it was the fact about that it was I forget exactly related to um, people that were uh, prisoners of war or something like that. No, well, uh, or or. This would be the other thing I can see them throwing at us that yeah. uh, it's not an experimental. That's what it was. Treatment. That's oh, okay. that's yeah. what it was. Um, I was trying to think back to what is that because it was like a week ago that happened. Um, All right. Well, it, to me, it depends on how you define that term. There certainly haven't been any long term studies on this, um, and well, there can't be because they got rid of the control group. <laughs> exactly. So. Um, so I would say that uh, yeah. All right, fine. Um, I mean, how long do you have to be testing something to consider it not experimental? Or I yeah. assume that they're just going based off of FDI, FDA approval. Yeah, there's. I guess that would be the... But even though that this vaccine hasn't been tested as long as any other vaccine, yeah. it did just uh, never mind all that. Yeah. Hmm. 
<laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, no real surprise there. But anyway, but mom was saying that uh, we should have given some numbers about um, what Elon Musk's companies are paying into the to the tax system. Yeah. So um, I, I just did for his employees because that was the real point that I wanted to drive home to people is that, you know, these people that create jobs for others, what they're paying in taxes isn't anywhere close to what they're contributing in taxes. That yeah. Everybody that they pay, the taxes that those people <laughs> pay is also a contribution of the cur- person that created the job. Yeah, right? absolutely. I think that's fair, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just looked up Tesla and SpaceX, how many employees they have in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and what their average salaries were. I just did it real quick just to get some idea. Yeah. Um, uh, on this. And uh, so Tesla and SpaceX together have about 80,000 employees in the U.S. And their average salary is um, actually a little higher than 100000 a year. Yeah. Which is a pretty good salary. Yeah. Oh, way. absolutely. Um, it, and it, it did say that uh, when I looked it up, it said it was higher than average in the field um, for both companies. For company. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So... Um, now, assuming that there that the tax burden on those employees at that uh, rate is roughly twenty five percent, which I think is a fair assumption. Yeah. Um, because actually they're in a higher tax bracket than twenty five percent, but you know you got some write offs and so on. Yeah. We we'll just assume a roughly a quarter of their income gets paid into the federal government in taxes. That's about two billion dollars. Yeah. Just them. Just yeah. the employees. That's yeah. not company taxes or any of the other stuff either. That's just, just, the, just employee the employees. Taxes, yeah. Um, is about two billion dollars. That and if if that's correct, with the U.S. government taking in about three and a half trillion dollars a year in tax revenue, that means that each of those employees, uh, for every less than two thousand dollars that the government collects, one of those dollars is from a uh, Elon Musk employee. Wow. Yeah. So one out of every $2,000 that the government collects comes from an Elon Musk employee. Yeah. And essentially, Elon Musk. Jobs yeah. he created. Yeah. Right? Stuff he's created in the economy. Yeah. I mean, now, Elon Musk is one of those people that also collects some from the government, uh, you know, mm. to do the work that he does, but... Yeah. All of that aside. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm not exactly for that <laughs> yeah, either. I'm it's not, not, no, it's no, not no. like I'm a fan of I'm that. I'm opposed to subsidies. <laughs> for uh, anybody. Or government grants or, you know, any yeah. of that stuff. Yes. But um, but anyway, I think it's worth pointing out. Absolutely. Um, and uh, and now you got some real numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so that's, that's all I've got. I did want to kind of close on a quote to go back to... Actually, I guess just like generally the political divide in this in this country. And... Um, and urge to people to try and be open-minded um, and, you know, see through to the facts. Try and try and be, you know, dispassionate with your, um, I don't know, with your assessment of what's going on. Yeah. And, um, and I, I thought of uh, a quote from C.S. Lewis um, that about, <laughs> essentially about arguing with people. And I think it's appropriate here because... Because my concern with the January 6th thing was that, you know, people have just made up their minds. Yeah. Like, they've already decided that they're either terrorists or, or freedom fighters. And there's, you know, there's no change in those minds for the most part. Yeah. And um, so I thought of this. He said, uh, with the man who reaches the result by reasoning or authority, I can argue. Of the man who claims not to reach it but to start there, we can only say that he has no such intuition as he claims. He is mistaking an opinion or more likely a passion for intuition. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, yeah. So don't be that guy that starts. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, all right. Well, uh, we, we've got several weeks in a row now. We, we're yeah, on a good we're, run. We're on a roll here. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. Um, so, and we Next expect week's to looking keep, good. <laughs> yeah, we expect to keep it going. So yeah. um, in the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe on Podbean, iTunes, YouTube. If Mike um, feels like putting it on YouTube. I did <laughs> like the next morning last night. The time, next thank morning, you. okay. All right. Fair Maybe enough. even that night. I don't even remember. Uh, but, but it happened. We're it not going to finish this podcast and be like, oh, we didn't do the last one. No, no. <laughs> okay. No, no. I got well, cool. it. I got it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, For as long as they allow us to be there, right? Yeah, exactly. We only had that one video taken down. So far. Although I haven't looked to see if we've gotten a, the last one was taken down. It <laughs> yeah. seems like if, if anybody listened to the end, it felt like something that might 
not make it. It was dicey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, like and share and tell your friends. And I don't actually have anything set up to do donations yet, but I do plan to do that. I just, at the beginning of the year, a bunch of things going on. Oh, yeah. Um, I also probably need to talk to somebody about the best way to set that up. So if you have yeah. any knowledge on that, yeah, <laughs> Mike any accountants Mike. out there or tax attorneys that would like uh, to give me a free consultation, you can contact me at Michael at the Liberty Mike. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I'll just contact my accountant. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hopefully, he won't charge me for something small like that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, but like I said, we, we do plan to get that started this year. Um, and yeah, hopefully yeah. that'll be helpful. Oh, and just as a side note, if you guys out there can help replace my current income, yeah, then I can spend the entire week preparing for these podcasts and reading. <laughs> yeah, all right. And uh, and probably do more podcasts <laughs> because yeah. I would have more information than I could do in a single podcast. Um, as it is. I'm stuck with just my free time, which there doesn't seem to be a lot of that. Yeah, that seems to be the same thing for me, man. That free time evaporates quick. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we're still giving you so much information. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, share that information with your friends. Yep. And we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right, especially for your friends. Yeah. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.